Namaskar. Good morning, friends. On behalf of the National Center for the Performing Arts in Mumbai, we are pleased to welcome you all. I uh, thank you so much for joining us for this morning session. Very interesting session is going to be. Um, we understand that um, many of you have logged in from different parts of India. So welcome you all. Um, at the outset, we would like to express our gratitude to HSBC as our esteemed supporters. Their generous support helps us to cover a three-day festival titled Bandesh, which is coming up soon from August 4th to 6th. Besides this, they also support three gurus who in turn teach nine disciples in the art of classical music. A three-day session of master classes are also supported by HSBC as well as a series of six workshops aimed at developing some soft skills such as what you are going to witness today. Today we are pleased to present the third workshop in this series on an important subject we believe uh, of management of physical health from the perspective of a performer. We know that performing art as a career could lead to physical problems arising out of long hours of practice in improper posture and lack of fitness that arises out of our ignorance mainly. Such problems may result in severe health related disorders that could have long term implications on the performing careers of these great artists. Today we are privileged friends to have with us Dr. Prakash Shroff, a distinguished practicing physiotherapist who is trained in orthopedics and specializes in sports and manual therapy. Having vast experience in dealing with pre and post-operative rehabilitation of orthopedic and sports injuries, Prakash ji is an award-winning physiotherapist serving on the panels of various international organizations. So this workshop is aimed at helping artists to understand the positive as well as negative implications of posture and its role in enhancing overall efficiency. We will also have discussion on the aspect of what is the correct posture which can prevent repetitive stress injuries and tips for increasing the efficiency of muscles and joints by putting them in a biomechanically advantageous positions. So not only talk about uh, what are the defaults in our posture, but how to improve to get better results out of what we are already doing. Uh, and thus enhance the overall capacity. We take this opportunity to thank Dr. Sharaf for offering to share his expertise so willingly with us. Uh, friends, the duration is about 60 minutes and thereafter we shall have demonstrations um, with the help of Dr. Sakshi Kothari. Uh, and thereafter we will take up your questions. So please feel free to post your questions which Dr. Sharaf will answer at the end of the session. Over to you Dr. Sharaf. Thank you very much Dr. Rao. And a big thank you to HSBC and NCPA for putting together this event. When I was approached for this event, I was quite fascinated to explore this new avenue as a physiotherapist. As she mentioned, my specialty is orthopedic and sports, and I've been dealing a lot with athletes. And then when I started looking into research for problems faced by musicians, I did find a lot of similarity here. There may not be a lot of load that athletes go through, but there is definitely one similarity that there is a lot of repetition, the number of hours you put in, which is where I realize that this is an unexplored group for us as physios and I'm sure it is for musicians and artists as well to know that physios can help. So we know the value of practice. You know the value of practice, I should say, as an artist, as a singer, as a dancer, any, any performer. That if you don't practice for a day, you know. You don't practice for two days, critics know. And day three, everybody else. That is why you need to keep going on and on and on. which may not be natural for your body. And it is only normal that you will start having some repercussions, some aches, some pains, because you're using your body beyond required. But yes, there's something that can be done about it. So I was surprised to find this term actually exists. It's called playing related musculoskeletal disorders. So yes, as you can see in this image where my pointer is showing, this guy is playing the violin with the best of alignment in the perfect posture but the sheer repetition, the sheer duration, the sheer time put in can also lead to musculoskeletal issues. 
So with everything still being in place, this is a possibility. And if you see, it affects 50 to 88 percent of musicians, which is almost everyone. So from a very mild version to a very strong problem, you could be getting in some kind of aches, pains at some stage of your life. And of course, more common with your upper extremity, which is being used repetitively again and again to perform. Some of the common causes have been divided, of which there are certain factors which are non-modifiable. We can do nothing about it. Like your instrument, it's the way it is. There may be some modifications that could be attached. You can change your body posture, alignment, seating posture, but the instrument stays the way it is. So we have to figure what we can do around it. Your anthropometrics, put it simply, how you are made. Your bone length, your joints, your structure. That is how you are. We can't change, or we shouldn't change, I should say. Gender. Surprisingly, some of the articles did point that females do tend to have more musculoskeletal problems than males, and I'm not sure why, and they are not very definite about it, but it's a finding that they have seen more incidents. There's no reason why they should have more. Playing conditions, of course, in terms of at where you are. If you are playing it as a hobby, and you have other things to do, like work and many hours of other things, household shows or other responsibilities, or you are a full-time performer, and you have a lot of shows coming up, a lot of practice before you actually start performing, various conditions could contribute towards the stress building up on your body. Joint laxity. Some people are born naturally lax. I mean, they can just pull their thumb and touch onto their forearm. But this is how it is. It's just that if your joints are naturally lax, your muscles need to work harder. So if your muscles are already working to stabilize joints, using them for performance is asking them for more. So you are at a little bit of a disadvantage, but you can compensate that with being fitter. Past trauma, any kind of injury, aches, pains in the past, will make that part vulnerable to give up earlier when you're performing repetitively or asking too much out of it. So how much you take care of your past injuries matters and your challenging repertoire. So it depends on what your schedule is. When it's crazy, you don't have time to take care of your own fitness. When it's better, that's the time to work hard on your body. Then there are factors which you can modify a little bit. So if you are overloaded in terms of your practice, your repertoire, you could, if in a position to choose how much you will do, how much you will not do, and space it out for your body also. Lack of rest and recovery. Now this is one thing we all are suffering from. If we want to do anything extra, one thing we would lovely, willingly give up is sleep. Sleep is rest, sleep is recovery, sleep is recharging. We would not use a mobile phone unless it's charged, but we don't think like that about a body. So I think this is one of the most underrated thing, but the most valuable thing, that we need to focus on good rest, good recovery, so that we are recharged for the next day. Poor posture is what we are going to discuss a lot on this. With posture, I mean alignment. A joint which is aligned better moves better. Once it's out of alignment, the movement is going to come at a higher cost. So what is that alignment, how can we correct it, how can we work around it, is what we'll be discussing more on this. Poor biomechanics, basically how the joint moves. So if it is not positioned well, it's not going to move well. So to have better mechanics, we will go one step back and first work on better alignment. If you have joint stiffness or hypermobility, which could have come because of some tight muscles, some awkward postures you've been spending time in, other activities that you're doing during the day, these can be loosened, worked on, and improved upon. Your instrument technique, which is where your tutor can give you feedback, because holding, playing in the incorrect way can not only lead to bad performance in terms of output as a player, but also put undue stress on the body and cause problems. Lack of physical conditioning. We can never undervalue fitness. If you want to perform more, longer, you need to be fitter. It's not just about practicing the skill, the technique, it's about being fit enough to be able to perform. Ultimately, you are using your muscles and your body to perform. So if your body is fitter, your energy is full, you're going to perform better. And poor injury management. So you, as I mentioned earlier, if you have any past issue, that part is vulnerable, that might give up early, get tired faster, get, start hurting, then you need to take care of it to be able to continue performing better. There are some psychological risk factors as well. If you have a general anxiety issue or performance-related anxiety, which is very normal, if you have some kind of depression from any past issues, if you put too much pressure on yourself for performance, or the institution or organization you're working for is putting too much pressure 
for the output that is required from you. If you have too much work or if you don't have work, if you have social phobia, scared of being around people, or if you have a personality type where you tend to have somatization tendencies. In short, you express psychological issues through physical problems. How much ever you treat the physical problems, if the underlying psychological issue is not treated, those pains will not go. Or if you're a perfectionist, then things don't come easy for you. Of course, these are beyond the scope of this lecture, so I'll just move on to the posture side of things. Now, if I go and discuss in detail a lot of the conditions that you could go through, one hour is not enough. I mean, I could easily talk about wrist problems of a piano player for an hour. But if I need one hour to talk about a lot of musicians, the wide variety of instruments that you play, the different positions you sit in, I need to be a bit more general. So I will be very general here, picking up few conditions, just so that you can understand what you can do about it and give you some broad tips that you can at least start managing your pain at a basic level. And where you can't manage it, you will need to take help from a professional. So some of the common type of pathologies or musculoskeletal problems or playing related musculoskeletal disorders that you would go through would be broadly classified into overuse syndromes, nerve entrapments, and focal dystonia. Now a little bit information about what these are. When we say overuse, the name is self-explanatory. It's a damage that occurs when a part of is used beyond its anatomical or physiological limit or beyond what it's meant or designed to be. Some of the common examples would be tennis elbow, decurve in stenosynovitis, and scapulothoracic bursitis. What are these now? I believe everybody is aware of what tennis elbow is. It's pain on the outer side of the elbow, which supposedly should be from playing tennis. But at this stage, we see a lot of people having tennis elbow from just repetitive use of hands for typing, for texting, use of mobile. And with musicians, of course, the upper limb is quite important. So a repetitive stress on the Forearm extensor muscles giving you pain on the outer side of elbow could simply be called tennis elbow. So just don't go on the tennis part of it. It's how the condition started. Then there is another condition which could affect musicians commonly because of the use of hand for intricate movements and the various positions, angles in which the wrist goes, putting a lot of stress on the thumb because that's the most mobile part of our hand can go in different angles. We try to reach out further with the thumb. Like in pianists, if they want to cover more keys, it is known that they try to use the thumb more than anything else to increase their span so that they can reach those keys. So that can lead to a lot of stress around the thumb here. Like you can see in this picture how the wrist is positioned in a way that it's going to put a lot of stress on the thumb because it is not in the most biomechanically advantageous position. And that could lead to some inflammation of tendons here because of constant rubbing against the tissues over there leading to a condition called decurvins tenosynovitis. And then, for everyone who's standing, sitting, not properly, or slouching, or if you have a natural muscle imbalance because of your habitual posture, because of a past injury or surgery, or just that your technique has developed like this from the beginning and you've not got correction, these kind of issues could lead to irritation of these structures called bursting. What are they? They are simple pouches. If you can see in the image over here, this is your shoulder blade and this is the rib. So there are pouches in between these bony structures to prevent friction between soft tissues as they move. Too much of irritation of these pouches will lead to inflammation. And that's called scapulothoracic bursitis. The most common cause of this would be sitting in a wrong posture where you're putting undue stress on it or too much of upper limb activity. And as musicians, performers, you are exposed to both. So this is one of the most common causes of any kind of neck and upper back pain affecting anyone who's sitting, slouched, or improperly, or using the upper limb too much. What are the symptoms that you would get if you are having an overuse syndrome, in general, without being very specific to any pathology or any part? There will be, of course, pain in the tissues, mainly the soft tissues, your muscles, your tendons. It will be aggravated by activity. It's coming on exertion. It's coming on overuse. It gets better with rest. When you stop doing the activity or knowing it, it feels good. It is localized over the affected area. And it could actually potentially lead to loss of performance because muscles which are hurting, muscles that are tiring faster, will have less strength, less stamina, and less precision. So it has implications for your performance. 
So it could be the most perfect posture in which you're playing, but simply because you're doing it repetitively over and over again, beyond your muscles normal natural capacity, beyond your current level of fitness, then it could lead to these problems. So one of the causes is despite everything being in place, sheer lack of fitness and more output than input or more demand than your body is up to will lead to overuse syndromes. Wrong playing posture, of course. As you can see on the left, the keyboard player is sitting in perfect alignment. And when you're better aligned, your body works more efficiently. So if you are out of alignment, definitely there's a lot more we are asking from the muscles. So if I ask you to keep your hand out and hold it up there, it's going to get tired a lot earlier than you holding your arm close to your body. So if you are going to put your body in an unnatural position where the muscles are working in either a shortened or a lengthened position, not in their natural position, they are going to give up faster. They are going to start fatiguing. The first thing you'll feel fatigue, then stiffness, eventually pain. And beyond that, you'll injure them. And of course, with the intricate use of hand, your wrist position also matters. So your grip is perfect when your wrist is slightly held in extension, where you lift the hand up when the palm is facing down. Slight extension gives you a better grip. If your wrist is bent either inwards or outwards too much, then your gripping is different. The muscle work increases, and that can lead to problems with hand. Other muscle imbalances, it could be your basic posture to start with. Maybe you have a different posture, and over a period of time, with the amount of sitting done in school, college, while studying, while performing, at work, if you're a part-time musician or a habit, you know, it's just a hobby for you, you already have a different alignment because of the other demands, other postures, and that could lead to build up of stress on certain areas, and eventually they all will start hurting. So muscle imbalances in terms of weakness, tightness, which can be assessed by a physiotherapist, is one of the big contributors to any kind of overuse syndromes. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, if you have laxity in the joints. Laxity means more work from the muscles to stabilize and more chance of them burning out with overuse syndromes. So this is something you have naturally, but yes, that doesn't mean that you cannot perform. There are options available. You can train your muscles and of course, if required, there are support, splints, taping can be done. There are options to keep them better aligned so that you can perform better. So when you're talking of overuse syndromes, how do we tackle them? So a few tips here. Frequent breaks are important. So if your muscle is getting exhausted faster, give it some recovery before you ask for it again to perform. Maybe you need longer breaks because the recovery is slower when you're already in pain, when the muscle is already overused. Reduction in play time, if possible, because that's what's causing the overuse. Posture and body awareness, one of the key factors, important factors, and which is one we'll be focusing on a lot on this lecture. Reduce loading with instrument adaptations, which is possible. Sometimes the instrument size, which can't be changed, may not be suiting your body size. So you could put some ad modifications on the instrument, modify your sitting, standing, things around you, and that can help. Review your playing technique, which is where your tutor can give you feedback, because as you play better, efficiency improves, it becomes easier on the muscles as well. Stop exercises that cause pain. Maybe you're doing other kind of exercise for fitness and you're already using muscles for performance and that's getting too much. So maybe it's time to cut down on some of the load or bring it down enough that your body is comfortable tolerating. You may need medicines at times if the pain is not getting down with rest and all the other things that you've tried but you need to consult a professional for that. Rehab after rest, of course training the muscles to get back in action. Muscles tend to switch off when there is pain, when there is injury. When you start performing, of course they start working, but maybe they need to be conditioned. They may need to be ready for the kind of performance that you are expecting out of it, which is where rehab comes in, to train them specifically with specific exercises to get better output. And gradual return to playing. It's always better to start low and go slow so that you keep moving, rather than just having a boom and bust where you do too much and then you do nothing for some time and then try and push again. The other category of symptoms you could get is nerve entrapments. Nerves are really sensitive structures, but they are not fragile. They do give very different kind of symptoms. If your nerve is getting nudged somewhere, pinched somewhere, or under compression from some tissues, you could get symptoms like pain, shooting, radiating, covering a wider area, 
There could be other sensations like tingling, numbness, burning, which is a bit scary and you want to know what's happening in your body. A few examples would be carpal tunnel syndrome, thoracic outlet syndrome and compression at the neck. So what's thoracic outlet syndrome? Your nerves coming out from the neck, as you can see in the picture, they go under the collarbone and there are a lot of muscles around it. And of course, the ribs below. So if you are using your shoulder in a slightly elevated position, as you can see in the image of this violinist, to hold the violin between this, his neck and shoulder, head and shoulder, he's elevating his shoulder a bit too much. It could lead to compression there, which could irritate the nerves coming to your arm and then you could get nerve symptoms in the hand. That's thoracic outlet syndrome. Carpal tunnel is what happens at the wrist. As you can see in this image, the wrist is quite bent. And in this, there is a lot of compression happening of the structures on the front of the wrist. And this compression could lead to lack of blood supply to the nerve, could lead to irritation of the nerve, could lead to accumulation of lactic acid, various reasons why the nerve will get irritated and start reacting. And that's called carpal tunnel syndrome. And then of course, nerve root compression in the neck can be a little more painful than other conditions because this is where the nerve is coming out at the spine level. This image here is not to scare you, but just to make you aware. You can see the natural changes that are happening in the bones. You will look at that in an X-ray and an MRI say, oh, this is arthritis or degeneration. That's normal, that happens. We are not gonna be as new as we were when we were born. These normal changes are okay for the body. This is a sign of adaptation but it should be an adaptation to required load, not undue stresses. These don't guarantee you should have pain. Of course, unfortunately, if you have a pathology like a disc bulge, it could pinch the nerves. And a lot of these do tend to happen if you're not playing in the most appropriate technique. Now, as you can see on the left, he's a magician, Ustad Zakir Hussain. I tried looking for a picture in which he's not sitting properly, I couldn't find one. He's always just perfect. And I have not put this picture to show that this is what causes pain, but this is what does not cause pain. So if you're better aligned, you have great neck mobility, you can look around, turn around, try slouching and turning left, right and see how much your neck gets restricted. So you do have these normal changes going on in the body, where the bones are changing, joints are changing, the disc is changing. But to add to that, if you're not aligned well, you have a bad posture, you are just accelerating damage and causing problems. So what do we do in case of the nerve entrapments? Now these are a little bit tricky. They don't settle very fast. They take some time to go. But the good thing is they do settle completely. It's possible to get better. So initially you will need to modify your activity, figure out the cause which is irritating the nerve. And then it will start calming down. Sometimes there are symptoms at rest also. You may not be doing anything. You may be getting symptoms at night. So splinting helps. We position the arm, neck in a way that reduces the stress or irritation of the nerve and hold it there for an extended period through splints, through tapes, through braces. Rest is important because only when you rest, you're gonna stop irritating the structure. Sometimes a steroid injection may be required if the symptoms are very acute, drastic, and interfering a lot, not with performance alone, but with daily activities, or as I mentioned, bothering you too much at rest as well. And of course, physiotherapy, we do have a lot of interventions where we can help you recover with these problems. Then there is an interesting problem called focal dystonia. Now, you may have heard of writer's cramp or a musician's cramp. That is your muscles going into a spasm when they are exhausted. This could be put down to a lot of lactic acid accumulation and the muscle giving up, I'm done. Well, you can stretch, strengthen, apply heat, ice, work around the cramping part of things. Dehydration could be one of the possible causes or low magnesium levels. But focal dystonia is like a medical disorder or a, I would say rather a neurological disorder where things happen involuntarily. As you can see in the images over here, these players are losing control of these fingers and they are just extending and going out and interfering with performance. Now this is something which is a bit serious. This needs help from a medical person and a physiotherapist together. So I wouldn't want to focus too much on this because this needs a lot more discussion and lots more exploring. So these are the three main categories that you will be looking at of which overuse syndromes is the most common one. And if you do get pain, what do you do about it? To know what to do about it, you need to first understand what kind of pain you are experiencing. So at a simple level, I'm gonna divide the pain into three categories for you. Explain what happens in these categories and what you can do about it. 
So at least when you have some kind of pain starting, you know what to do in the first few days. If it settles good, if no, you know you need to take help. So let's divide the pain into three parts. It could be inflammatory, something is inflamed. It could be ischemic, it's coming from exertion at the end of the day, or there is a nerve-related component to pain. Now it's possible for you to have all three, but one component will be a major component, which is where we start targeting our treatment first. So if your pain is majorly inflammatory pain, when something is swollen, now usually that happens when something is injured, or you have an existing arthritic condition which has flared up, or if your uric acid is high and you have gout, then there is a tendency of swelling in some joints when they are stressed. So what are the signs if you have a pain because of something inflamed in your body? Now first thing is, when you get up in the morning, that part will be stiff. It will be hard to move. Say if you twist your ankle, you know when it's swollen, it's hard to move the ankle. There's so much swelling fluid around, it makes it difficult for the part to move normally. So this stiffness will be worse in the morning because you've not moved a lot all night and there is a lot of inflammatory fluid existing around it, which makes movement difficult. There will be night pain because there is a lot of pressure on all the structures due to the inflammation. Our nerves, they tend to react more at night. Nerve pains are common at night. So overall, night is difficult in the first few days of any inflammatory pain. You get stiff after being immobile for some time. Now joint movement works like a pump to drain fluid from the area. Because you are inflamed, you have more than required fluid there. And if there is extra fluid getting accumulated in a smaller space, it's going to start pressing on all the structures around it, which hurts. So if you move the part, that mechanical movement is going to work like a pump to push the fluid out and you start getting more comfortable. So as you get stiff after being immobile for some time, it hurts for the first few steps. But as you keep moving, it only gets better. Your pain can be quite acute. So as I mentioned, if something is inflamed, there's a lot of fluid present over there, a lot of pressure on all the nerves, a lot of chemicals being released, which is part of the normal healing process. We need that. But yes, they being present there can lead to a lot of stimulus to the nerves, which can make the pain really bad. And thanks to that pain being so bad, we will give attention to it and take care of it. If we didn't have so much pain, we would not even bother about something that's injured or inflamed. Other signs of inflammation would be redness. The part is red, it appears swollen, and when you touch it, it's a bit warm. Okay, this is best managed with rest, ice, support, you know, braces. Some people use crepe bandage, any kind of sleeve, various supports available. And you may need anti-inflammatories that your doctor can prescribe. Then the other category of pain is ischemic pain, which comes towards the end of the day. I mean, it's very common people who are sitting on screen as well. The back gets tired by the end of the day or in case of your performance, the kind of muscles you're using, your hand, your wrist, your elbow, neck, anything, repetitively using that muscle, that muscle banks on oxygen for energy. As the oxygen is used and you don't have enough, you will start forming lactic acid. That lactic acid is not going to feel quite comfortable. It's like soreness that sets in after a gym workout because we intentionally push that muscle to burn it out, to exhaust it. That could be happening to you in your natural day-to-day -day performance schedule. And that pain would be described as ischemic pain simply due to the accumulation of lactic acid. Now we need to wash this lactic acid out. That is how we can help with this pain. So this pain will come on exertion. It could be coming at the end of the day. It feels better with rest because we give time for the lactic acid to be washed out. There is enough oxygen coming in, more energy getting generated and the muscle can perform better. There is no morning stiffness here. In fact, people feel better when they get up after rest. Stretching helps, massage helps to drain that lactic acid to ease off the muscle tension. Heat helps to get in more circulation. Tablets may not help here because we are not looking at any inflammation to bring down. And there is no tablet here to wash out lactic acid. Stretching, heat, massage, bit of movement, all these are better alternatives. And of course, you need to now check whether it is because of an improper posture or you're lacking strength and conditioning all flexibility in muscles. So exercises definitely help a lot with this kind of pain. Now if you have a nerve related pain, these can be a little funny and a little scary. Because it could be along a spot. We assume nerve pain would be like a shooting pain along the nerve, along a certain area. But surprisingly, even a spot pain can be nerve pain. It could be along a line, it could be a wider area. And very interesting part, it does not have a stimulus response relationship. 
Now what does that mean? Now with muscles, joints, life is simpler. You load them and if they can't take it, they will complain. You get pain. You load them less, they are happy, they won't complain. You don't load them, there is no pain. With nerves, you load them, they may complain. They may complain later. They may complain after a few days. So we really are not able to judge how much is too much. Because they have this property called latency and summation. Basically, in simple words, they may react later or they may react after repetitive stimuli. So we don't know how much is too much, which makes them a little tricky to manage. Having said that, they can still be managed, which is the good side. So as I mentioned earlier, itching, burning, tingling, numbness, any symptom which you struggle to describe can be easily put down to nerve pain. And any pain which you are struggling to describe, where you feel, I did something, it was hurting, I did the same thing, it's not hurting, can be put down to nerve pain. So you don't need to be scared that the doctor will not believe I have this pain. We can understand because we know that nerve pains behave like this. And this definitely needs help from a physical therapist and maybe intervention at times when it is too acute to be handled by physical therapy alone. Now when I started looking at postures and I started looking at musicians and the artists and the scope that is available, it was crazy. Now this is a picture from the Indian music experience in Bangalore. It's a museum for music. I j was lucky enough to visit it earlier this year and it is overwhelming, it's mind-boggling. And this is a wall which shows the different kind of instruments and I'm sure these are the just few that we use in India and there is a wider scope. So if I were to break down my lecture into what, how I could help these different performers using these instruments, one hour would not be enough. So I decided let's keep it simple. Let's go on the postures. We are performing in standing, in sitting and sitting on the floor. So what are the possible things that could go wrong? What are the possible things that you could do to make it right? So if you look at your normal posture, we have three natural curves. At the neck and the low back, the curve is similar. The spine is curving inwards. In the mid back, the spine is curving outwards. As you can see in the image on the left, this pianist is sitting in the most appropriate, perfect posture. And this musician is sitting in a slouch posture. Now, of course, there is a lot of stress on the structures behind which means the muscles, ligaments, joints, etc. In addition to that, in the spine, we have the structure called the disc. Now, people are often very scared of the disc. It's like any other structure. It's not something that is the end of life. And it's something that has a certain duty to perform. It is used to a certain amount of load. Of course, when the disc problem happens, it happens with a very trivial thing. A little bit of bending forward, a sneeze, a cough, can bulge a disc. But remember, for it to bulge today, it has gone through this stress for many years repetitively to finally give up now. So it's not a delicate structure, but it is a very sensitive structure or a crucial structure because it is lying very close to the nerves and the spinal cord. So its relationship to the nerves makes it a very crucial structure to be taken care of. Now, as you can see in the images over here, this is a normal disc in the center. If there is a bit of distraction that happens through attraction machine that we give or you're using an inversion table the structures you can see the side structures that's called the annulus fibrosis or the ligament like material soft tissue and in the center there is a nucleus which is more like a jelly water and some proteins they get stretched they go through these stresses it's normal they tolerate that when you're sitting there's a bit of compression happening in fact we lose water from the disc during the day we are actually sh a bit shorter at the end of the day than we are in the morning and then when we lie down at night, the disc absorbs that water and becomes normal. So imagine if there is already inflammation. That normal water absorption happening at night plus the inflammation makes the pain really bad. So as you can see in this image, when you bend backwards, the tissues, the structures are pushed forward because of the compression and they are flexible and soft enough to be pushed there. If you bend forward, they are pushed backwards, which is what is the problem with most of the bending issues. Bending forward leads to maximum disc issues. The disc tends to not only be pushed back, but it is pushed back enough number of times that it gets injured. There is a bit of inflammation. The center jelly oozes out. And you can see the space in between the bones, the tiny spaces where nerves come out from. It can start irritating these nerves and start giving you shooting pain as well. Of course, even when you're bending onto your side, there are uneven forces on the disc. It's getting pressed on one side, stretched on the other side. And when you're turning, it's being twisted. 
and it is used to taking these stresses. Not that if you do these, it's going to give up, but if you do these way beyond its capacity in awkward postures, then it's going to give up. Okay. So if you can see these various positions, this is an example of how you could subtly build up stress on these discal structures, being in a wrong position for hours and hours because of your practice. Now we normally talk a lot about a slouch spine as you can see in this image, but we can also get into a trouble if we arch our back too much, thinking I'll protect my disc and I'll go to the other extreme, but you're then putting stress on some other structures. So the best part is to be aligned perfectly and not be out of alignment in either a wrong posture or an overcorrected posture either. Okay. So here are some examples of how musicians could be in an altered alignment which is not good for them. You can see how one shoulder is elevated here, other one's depressed and you can see how the shoulder blade is jutting out. Now whether it is something that has become a habit because of the way the person has learned to handle the instrument or the person already had this kind of muscle imbalance either from birth, which is rare, but could happen, or it's postural from other habits, or it is due to lack of strength in certain muscles. We always have a dominant and non-dominant side. So a little bit of imbalance that does exist, but it does not bother us until we push our body beyond the threshold. You can see here three good examples of how you can go wrong with playing a violin. From elevating the shoulder to turning the neck too much to keeping the arm forward. Of course, these are all compensations we do to just make sure that we perform better. But when done in not the best alignment, the performance doesn't last too long. You will start stressing some structure and it will start complaining soon. Now we cannot discuss posture without discussing breathing. Breathing is important not only for people who are using wind instruments, but even for singers and for every other performer as well. Now when you breathe in, that's the only way of getting in oxygen. That's the only way your muscles have supply of energy. If you don't have oxygen, you're going to run out of energy soon. Lactic acid will be accumulated and then you will start getting tired, stiff and it will start hurting. So breathing is important for you not only in terms of playing wind instruments or talking or singing, it's also important in terms of your endurance. If your body is well oxygenated, you have more energy to perform longer. And you can see this is what happens to us when we breathe in. Our chest expands in all four directions. As we breathe out, our chest compresses. But if you are slouched forward, as you can see the third image, your chest is already compressed. So if you're already compressed and have reduced your lung capacity, you're not going to get much oxygen. Now this could be for two reasons. One, you've started working in this slouch posture and are not aware of it. Or it could be because of age, you're just drooping forward because you've not maintained the flexibility. And you'll see that if even when you've seen singers perform and they want to project their voice, you'll see them actually looking up rather than looking down because it's not possible to perform when you're in a slouch position. Of course, it's a not a good body language. It's not interpreted well, but at the same time, it's not efficient energy wise also. Now, when we talk about posture correction, there are two parts to it. As you can see at the image on the left, very crudely, if I can describe, There'll be tightness of structures here in the back. These muscles, they're on stretch. They'll be loose and lax. They'll be weak. Same thing here. The shoulder blade muscles here will be stretched and that's why they will get weak and then underperform. And if you look at the front structures, they are tight. So we can work on correcting muscle imbalance, which will help you get into a better posture. The second thing and the most important thing about posture correction is it has to be an active thing. It has to become a good habit. Bad posture is a bad habit. Good posture is a good habit. It's only when you consciously work on it, it's going to get better. And you have to consciously work on it enough that your body starts feeling, this is now my normal, this is how I will be now. And there are examples of how you can work. A lot of settings can be done. Like we tell often people working on computer, similar things apply to a lot of these. You can see how this pianist is sitting the most aligned position. And even when there is some playing to be done on the side, this kind of movement is much more efficient than actually slouching or tilting or dropping one shoulder. Of course, it has its own challenges and extra demands, but at least it's in the right position and you can get better output from the muscles when they are better aligned. Here, I would like to emphasize or point out on the importance of pelvis in posture. The pelvis is the hip bone area where the hip joints meet. It's like a big bucket or a cup like thing around and your pelvis th can tilt forward and backward. And as you can see on the image on the right where the pointer is, 
when the pelvis is forward all curves exaggerate and if you just bring it back to neutral the posture gets better so one easy way of correcting posture is by keeping your pelvis correct and you can see in this side position as well if the pelvis drops you can see how the spine goes out of alignment which could lead to undue stresses on one side versus the other okay of course in terms of wrist as well as i mentioned earlier when you're holding instruments playing instruments if your wrist your palm is facing down when you take the hand up it's called wrist extension and hand down is wrist flexion so if you are slightly extended your grip is always better if you take your hand up your arm will hand will struggle to make a good grip if you take it down it will struggle to make a good grip so having proper wrist alignment also matters as far as performance is concerned there could be some modifications done on the instruments as well you can see a small thing attached over here to fit in the thumb there are a lot of other things that could be done around the instrument but for that you need to be assessed with the instrument to see what modification would suit you the most from the as a physio point of view we can offer options like taping and splints and braces now you can see here how the drummer's hand is going into a bit of a excessive movement where the thumb goes up we call it deviation if we want to stop that from happening we can give it a splint or we can tape it and then maintain the wrist neutral for the performance so modification of instrument possible and adjusting the body alignment or position through splints braces taping possible and of course there are braces that are available to correct posture as well i am not a big fan of these as i mentioned earlier i feel it's a good habit it has to be inculcated and it should be something that should be worked upon consciously actively yes you can use it in the beginning so that your body learns that this is my new alignment this is how i should be and then once you're getting used to it please wean it off this shouldn't be a handicap that as far as the braces on your good and the once braces off your posture is out so that's one reason why i'm a bit skeptical of using them but it would be a good starting point to train you into a good habit and wean it off to continue the good habit so if you were go to a physiotherapist what all they need to know from you you have any performance related musculoskeletal disorder as a physio we would like to know your medical history your musculoskeletal examination will be done to see what is the normal alignment your muscle length muscle strength joint mobility that's our own specific examination that we work on we would like to observe your playing posture with your instrument if possible and maybe even observe your performing because your posture could be different when you're performing an easier piece versus a difficult piece and maybe when you're performing under stress things change a bit more if possible a video analysis would be great because in the clinic this examination done at that point of time some features could be missed but if there is a video analysis taken from front back side there could be enough time to slow it down and analyze things more in detail and a history of your playing habits as a musician how much practice you do every day how many hours you spend and in terms of your performance history what are you looking forward to what's your schedule like everything matters as far as treating it is concerned now honestly as i mentioned earlier it's quite similar to what i would do with an athlete you may not have the load in terms of instruments that you have to carry around but you definitely have the load in terms of the number of hours the repetition the duration that should be taken care of so some of the practice tips we would give to keep your muscles and bones in good health would be a good warm up that goes for everything warm up in terms of your playing that you would do and warm up in terms of keeping your body supple like we would recommend to anyone who's going to the gym or any kind of exercise or before any kind of performance even if it is on field a good warm up always helps your muscles are active and ready for action a good amount of stretching and strengthening stretching of all the tight muscles so they help you stay in better alignment they don't put you in a bad posture strengthening of muscles that are holding you up in good alignment and the muscles that you are using for your performance and your instrument breaks rest and recovery as i mentioned earlier good recovery will lead to good performance later it's only when you recharge you have enough energy to discharge graded exposure and pacing now when you're suffering from an injury you are at zero you've stopped working when you get back you can't get back to where you left it always has to be step wise so the more graded you are in your exposure the slower you recover the better because there is no looking back you are allowing your body time to get used to the load you are putting through and then challenge it a bit more so don't have haphazard recovery don't go all out and then say i will rest later start low go slow then there is no looking back 
visual imagery can help. This is also used by a lot of athletes. They visualize the best of their performances and so can you do. I mean, you, if you take a video of yourself playing and watch it and close your eyes and just imagine you doing it. Science shows that when you imagine a certain movement, a certain performance, you are using all the circuits that would be working when you are actually doing it, but to a lesser extent. Say, if you are watching yourself perform on a video, you're using 100 fibers in your brain. Just a rough example, of course, it's much more. If you are imagining yourself, you use 1,000 fibers, and when you're performing, you're using 10,000. So just visualization alone is keeping those circuits alive from the brain, which will actually translate into performance when you're out there. So don't think that visualization is going to be a waste. It's going to keep you in the loop. It's going to keep your circuits working. And it's going to definitely work towards the output when you actually perform, which can give a good break to your muscle, which can also help sharpen and strengthen the pathways you'll be using for performance. Awareness of posture. Yes, a joint, when aligned well, moves well. So if you have good posture, it's going to be the good beginning. As they say, well begun is half done. So a good posture, a good starting position, good alignment is well begun. Okay? And stress and anxiety management. Of course, if there are psychological factors interfering with all these, they need to be handled. Because with the best of stretching, strengthening, exercises, if there are other factors influencing your performance and not taken care of, something will happen, something will show up again. What can we offer as physiotherapists? Now for all the muscles that are hurting, aching, we have various treatment options. Some of the newer ones that are used a lot now is dry needling. Now dry needling is very different from acupuncture. We use the same needles that are used by acupuncturists, but the concept is totally different. We assess the muscles that need a release and we needle those muscles and we do it for orthopedic muscle pain only. The other option would be using dry cupping. These are suction cups which work on a different principle, a little gentler treatment. If you've seen the Olympics, you've seen them on Michael Phillips and everybody is aware of this technique now. This also is used for releasing soft tissue pain as one of the options. Then we can release the muscles manually, what we call manual therapy or soft tissue therapy. We can use our hands to loosen joints. It's called joint mobilization. And then we also have instruments which we can use to release soft tissues. Now, they can do release at fascia level, muscle level, a lot of options are available. These are among the little painful techniques, but definitely they give more results than others. Of course, we use a lot of machines as well. It's called electrotherapy. And we will give you rehab exercises as well. Because whatever we release should not need to be released again if it is taken care of. So all the stretching, strengthening, posture correction, everything matters. If you don't do rehab, you're going to take endless treatment. So the treatment is just the beginning. It's to make you comfortable. It's to take care of the pain. But your long-term solution would be all the other advice that we would offer in terms of exercises, posture correction, if required any correction with your playing posture, etc. Just to make sure that you don't come back again with the same problem at least. So just for you to understand these things, we have a bit of a demo section now where we'll show you in what ways posture can go wrong, what are some quick tips we can give you to correct that posture. And a few simple stretches that you can do which can help correct your posture if your muscles are already tight. Okay? Can we have Dr. Sakshi, please? Now, this is the problem we normally face, that everybody is slouched most of the time. And of course, with the way life has become, our screen usage has forced us to become this way. We are not designed to be like this. Now, the most common advice given to someone who's slouching is, we say, can you just pull your shoulders back and can you tuck your chin in? Now, as you can see, I have corrected part of it, but she still doesn't look comfortable because this is not complete correction. Let's have you slouch again. Now, if you notice when she slouched, can we have you straighten up, please? And slouch. As she slouched, she actually drops from the chest. This is what also needs correction. So the first thing I would like to advise is, can you please lift your chest bone up? You can see a lot of correction has already happened. Now, if she had been slouched, for years, for a long period of time, she would still be slightly forward in her shoulders and in the neck. That's when I would add the extra tip of, can you now slightly pull your shoulders back and tuck your chin in a bit for me? So I would add this correction after I first help her lift the chest up. Similar thing would happen in sitting. Can we have you sit cross legged over here, please? Oh. And face that side. 
Now what happens in sitting is often people tend to let go. Could you have you drop please? Now when you drop like this, you can see that the upper back has also dropped. And again, I would not focus on just lifting the upper back. As I mentioned earlier, the pelvis is very important for correcting posture. So what I would first want is when we sit, we have to be aware that we have two big seat bones that we sit on. Now as she slouched, can we have you drop a little more? You can see that she'll be putting more pressure behind the tailbone. If I just ask her to arch her back a little bit, you can see everything from there upwards is getting corrected on its own. This could be done when you're sitting on the floor or you're sitting on a chair. You can see how she has shifted weight onto the seat bones. The tailbone is not touching down. The back is slightly arched and then her body has got aligned. Now, if I need more correction, I can say now, could you please lift your chest up? Shoulders slightly back, chin slightly in. And then when it looks fine, I'll say, this is it. This is what you need to maintain. Now, I understand being in this position is going to be very new for your body and it has to learn being like this. Can we have your slouch place? For a lot of us, this is normal. Our body feels this is my zone, I'd like to be here. So what do we do now? We say, okay, now let's have you straighten up and be here. It's a lot of effort, mentally and physically. So one small tip that we can give you is if you could have some kind of support cushion pillow that you could rest it against. That pillow is not going to let you slouch and it's going to keep you better aligned for hours and hours and hours, whether you're on a chair or on the floor. And it could help a lot in giving this constant feedback to your body. Your joints are perceiving this as the new normal. And for it to actually be a new normal, it has to be done again and again, repetitively, so that it says, now this is where I'm going to be. And imagine being in this position is much less work for all the muscles. Your bones are stacked onto each other. If they are stacked well, there's less work required because they are just because of the sheer effect of gravity being held in place. But if we slouch, you can see how much they are working hard. It's like the muscles are trying to hold in all stretched out position. They're going to give up very fast. So this alignment matters. Now, if she is tight in certain muscles, it's going to be hard for her to maintain this alignment. She will try to do this, but what if she's tight on the front? She's tight in the stomach muscles, tight in the hip muscles. That is not letting her move the pelvis. So we have some stretching exercises that can be done. So a combination of stretching the muscles and being aware of this alignment will help you achieve this good posture. As I said, this is the beginning. Once you align your position better, your joints, muscles will automatically work better. So if you are slouched, now let's have you turn to the side. Yeah. Now slouch and look right and look left. You can see the amount of range she has. Now let's have you straighten up and now look right and left. We automatically get more range because the joints are positioned better. So imagine the amount of harm we could do working in inappropriate positions. We're putting undue stresses, we are restricting range, we are inviting trouble. The spine is made up of a lot of bones. There are many vertebrae, there are many discs, there are many joints. It's the most mobile area designed to move a lot. With the way our life is today, we are using it the least. So we have the price to pay. So if you maintain good mobility of your spine, you can expect to perform better, longer, healthier, happier. So let's talk about some of the stretching exercises that you could do to help you correct with this. So can we have you stand again? Turn around. Yeah, and slouch. So if this slouch position, as we mentioned earlier, the possibility of the neck muscles getting tight, chest muscles getting tight, back muscles getting tight, and of course, the hip muscles getting tight, hamstrings getting a lot of load because of working too hard, they become stiff. So there are a lot of muscles that we need to work on in terms of stretching. We'll show you a few basic stretches, how you could work on helping you get into a correct posture. Okay, so let's have you lie down. So some of the simple stretching exercises would be, one is for the hamstring muscle. Let's start at the bottom end. Now this is a belt taken from the shoulder. It's actually the shoulder strap of a laptop bag. So if you have any waist belt, dupatta, long towel, you just need to make a small loop. Can we just put this around the foot and keep your legs down, please? Keep this down and pull this up. So you don't need to work on lifting the leg. It has to be done passively with the belt, keeping the knee straight, because if your knee is not straight, you will not get a stretch in the back of the thigh. And you can give your hamstring muscle or the muscle on the back of the thigh a good stretch. If we can shift this belt slightly forward here, closer to the toes, you can get a stretch on the calf muscle as well. 
So this can help you stretch the back of the leg in one shot. The only place I would not recommend doing this is if you have nerve-related pain. This can put a lot of pressure on the nerve and cause more symptoms. So do it when you have proper muscle tightness and no sciatic kind or nerve-related pain in the leg. So that's for the hamstring and the calf muscle. Now, can you just take your leg up? No, this one down, please. Take this up. Put one hand here on the knee, the other hand above the ankle. I recommend above the ankle because I don't want unnecessarily twist of the ankle. Now, can you take this knee towards the opposite shoulder and now pull this a little more. This is for stretching the buttock area. We call the piriformis muscle. It's one of the very important muscles if you want to sit comfortably and correct your pelvis posture in sitting. So this can be done both sides. Okay. All the stretches, we would recommend that you pull to the beginning of stretch. We don't want you to be aggressive. We don't want you to stretch so much that it starts hurting. Because when it starts hurting, you'll start tensing and you'll be fighting against your own force. As far as you're feeling a stretch, the job is getting done. So go to the beginning of stretch, try and hold the stretch for 20 counts, do at least two reps a couple of times a day. That's when your muscles will start loosening. And of course, after loosening everything, get back in the good position. Otherwise, you go in a bad posture, you're going to tighten them again. So it'll all go waste. So that's for the buttock area. Now let's have you bend both legs and drop your legs to one side. So this can help stretch the low back area. Now you may be getting a stretch all the way from the upper back down to the buttock area. If you want to localize it more to the low back area where you tend to get the tightest, you need to just take your legs a bit higher so that the knees are in line with the hip. Or you could drop the leg down further. But very important that you keep the shoulder down. So you are actually putting your upper body twisting in one direction and lower body is twisting in the other direction to stretch the low back area. Okay. Let's have you go back. And now, can you go on your stomach, please? Now, if you want to stretch the front of the thigh, a lot of people do it in standing, but I would prefer doing it lying on the stomach because it keeps your body better aligned. Same way, we can put the belt around the foot. Can we have you hold this, please, with both hands? Yes, and pull. Okay. So you don't need to work too hard. It's just going to be easier to pull with both hands in a relaxed position till you get a good stretch in the front of the thigh. Okay, there should be no pain in the knee in this. Okay, let's go off this please. And then one good stretch for the abdominal muscle. Now as I mentioned earlier, when we drop, we drop from the front. It's the chest bone that's dropping down and going closer to the pelvis. And if we want to correct from here, we need to stretch this. So if you're very tight, you can start with first coming up on your forearms. Okay, you can keep your neck in neutral position. Okay, uh, look a little down so that you don't put undue stress on the neck. If that's not enough, you can come up on your hands to give it a better stretch. And if you feel you're very flexible and need a little more, can we have you go down, please? You first bend your knees to make sure the pelvis is locked and then you come up. That can give you a stronger stretch. Okay, thank you. Let's have you sit up now. A few simple stretches for the neck. So stretching the muscle on the side, which tends to get affected the most. So when we slouch, we tend to be in an elevated position. So the muscle that we use to elevate or shrug is called the trapezius. This tends to stay in a shortened position most of the time because of poor posture. So to stretch that, we'll ask you to first take your hand behind the back. This is to ensure that your shoulder blade is locked and it's not coming up when you're stretching. Then we will ask you to tilt your head to the opposite side and pull it further to give a better stretch. You could do a little bit of rotation or turning to either side to see which position gives you the best stretch. That is for the muscle which is going from the neck all the way down to the shoulder on the side. Now to stretch the muscle at the back of the neck, we will ask you to tuck the chin in first. And while keeping the chin tucked in, you need to look down and then push your head down. This will stretch the back of the neck. And to stretch your upper back region, Let's have you stand, please. Turn around, get your hands forward, and push your arms forward. So this should stretch the upper back area, and it's not necessary to hold the head up and feel stress on the neck. You can just let your head loose and keep it relaxed. The stretch is supposed to be a comfortable thing. It's not supposed to feel any stress anywhere else. It should just give you a good stretch at the muscle intended to be stretched. Okay, And then stretching the chest muscle. Now for that, you would need a wall. Let's have you turn. So if suppose I'm the wall, let's you lock your arm in this position and you have to walk forward 
so that the arm stays behind and the body goes forward. It's a movement where the arm is being pulled back. Now this can be done at different angles, a higher angle above the shoulder, a lower angle and if you're not comfortable, you can also do it with the hand straight. Okay, this can be a little more comfortable to start with and you can progress to the other exercises later. So that will be for stretching the chest. A few simple tips about sleeping posture as well. Let's have you lie on your side. Now if you're a side sleeper, people often ask what should I use? Thick pillow, thin pillow, no pillow. Now you need to make sure that your body is aligned. If you're upright and you're aligned better, you need to make sure you're aligned better when you're lying down as well. Now, a lot of people have this habit of putting the head on the pillow. Now what is important here is we support the neck. This, this space is empty. So we will just ask you to tuck the pillow in and you feel the neck relaxes instantly. There has to be more or less in line with the body, neither tilted up too much nor tilted down too much. So if I put the pillow in a way that her shoulder is on the pillow, that's still not the most comfortable position. So neither head on pillow nor shoulder and pillow, pillow under the neck. So this would be an appropriate position. And as you can see, I'm using a simple pillow, nothing fancy over here. Same way if you're lying on your back. People often tend to put their head on the pillow and then they feel a lot of stress building up on the neck or they put their shoulders on the pillow where there is no support to the neck. So again, I would definitely need a slightly thinner pillow when you're lying on the back. And same rule applies, we just tuck it under the neck. So a thinner pillow when you're on your back and a thicker pillow to fill the gap between your head and the bed. Both times the pillow should be tucked into the neck. And how do you know which position you should be in and which pillow you should buy? I will, you would have seen that normally whatever position you start with is your comfort position. You will end up going more in that. So based on how you sl start sleeping, it could be thinner pillow or thicker pillow. And if you're on your stomach, it's okay if you don't have a pillow. Because when you go on your stomach, you'll be turning your head completely to one side to sleep. So at this stage, giving a pillow would actually cause more stress on the neck. So I would not recommend having a pillow when you're lying on your stomach, okay? Provided your neck is flexible enough. If it's not, then lying on the stomach, again, is not gonna be comfortable. Let's have you lie on your back. Now, a lot of people are not comfortable lying straight in terms of the low back point of view. Can you have your legs straight, please? So when people have these this position, they feel the back is a bit arched and they feel stress on the back. So one way of making this comfortable would be by tucking in a pillow under the knees. This brings the back in a more natural, relaxed, curved and you can sleep more comfortably. However, if you are a side sleeper, let's have you go on the side, please. The spine is taken care of, but sometimes you may have a bigger pelvis and the knee is dropping down and that could put a lot of stress on the hip and the thigh area then you could always use a pillow to make yourself comfortable. Now you should ideally not need this because you've been sleeping without all this all your life. But this becomes important when you have some kind of pain, discomfort, which is interfering with you sleeping comfortably. So these are the some tips that you could use. Now another thing that you could do to correct posture, let's have you sit up please, is most of the time because of being in a slouched or a hunched position, the mid back becomes very stiff and very tight. So can we do something to open that up? Take a simple towel, roll it up. Now the thickness of the roll matters. If you're very slouch, you need to be rolling it a bit less. If you're not very slouch, you need a very thick roll. What should you feel? You have to keep it in the center here. Can we have you turn for a second, please? And show your back, please. Turn, please, turn. Face there. The towel is going to occupy this space from the neck to the end of the ribs. This is your mid-back area, what we call the thoracic area. This is the area which is going into a lot of bending forward and needs correction. So this is how we are going to position to begin with. Now let's have you lie down on this. And I want her to be on that curve and we may may not use a pillow depending on how comfortable you are. Some people feel without the pillow, the neck is dropping a bit too much and it's not very comfortable. But maybe the pillow is lifting the neck so much that there is not a good stretch. So we can always use a towel to give less of an elevation. As you see, I've curled the towel to just give support to the neck. Being in this position for a few minutes every night could help open up the chest and help loosen the thoracic area and make it more mobile. The mid-back becomes freer and posture corrections get easier. 
So you can see how it's quite simple to use stuff which is easily available, easily accessible, and work a lot in correcting your posture. One last thing that we would like to show is what about the muscles that are tight? Can we release them? Now two common areas that you could work on is tightness of the thigh area we call the IT band. Can we have you turn onto your side, please? So all you need to do is, in this side-lying position, take a regular tennis ball. You will get it anywhere very easily. And put it under your thigh. And put your other leg over it. Okay? That should give enough pressure to press on a point that hurts a little bit. And you need to release a point that's hurting. If it's not hurting, don't bother. Now you could move it a little bit, or you could just sustain it over there. Give it a minute, give it two minutes, the part will start actually easing off and it will hurt less or may stop hurting. That's the time when you shift the ball a little higher or a little lower to find the point that hurts. So while you're lying down and reading something or watching something, distract yourself and get some release work done. What we are releasing is the points between the two bony prominences here. In the hip you have a bone and at the knee joint here there are bones. All the soft tissues in between need to be released. Release should not be done on any point which feels bony or where the tissues are meeting the bone. It's going to hurt a lot, but nothing is going to benefit you. Okay? Let's have you stand again, please. One of the other common areas that you would want to release is the shoulder blade area. Okay? So, assuming I'm a wall here, the ball is against the wall. And as I mentioned earlier, that you could actually stay in position. If you want more pressure, you can take your feet forward and lean more into the wall. And you can do a little bit of movement in terms of squatting and straightening to do a good release. You can use this for releasing your upper back area or shoulder blade area, the spine area in the middle, the spine area in the low back. Now very important that this ball is rubbing on muscles, soft tissues and not on bones. Nothing in the center. Anything next to the spine where it feels soft enough. You just need to lean into the ball. You can take your feet further if you want to lean more. Sustain the pressure if you would like to, or move if you want to make, do a good release. A good release for two, four, maybe five minutes, whatever you can tolerate at the end of the day, would help ease off the tension in the muscles. Okay, thank you, Sakshi. So that was a bit of a routine that you could do for one, making yourself more aware that this is a good posture I should be in, stretching some of the key muscles that could help you improve your alignment to be in good posture, releasing some of the muscles that are getting too tired and a bit tight and need a bit of easing off and you're not in the stage where you have enough pain that you need treatment. Some of these remedies could actually get you better and you may not need to see any therapist. But if your pain is persisting beyond a time, it's time you take professional help. Okay? So I did go through a lot of articles to accumulate this information and a lot of experience to finally come up with this, but uh, I must say that I think there should be more research on performers. I found way more number of articles on athletes, and I see that you are a very unexplored subgroup, and you are actually having problems that you're facing, and that can be helped. I think we should have much more research and much more facilities for helping you perform better. Really, really very elucidating and very clear um, expose exposition on this very important subject and uh, even as a I found that uh, even lay people you know like you said not really practitioners of any music instrument or uh, practitioner, practitioner of that kind but you know like the sheer any common person can use lot of tips that you've been giving so thank you so much so friends we have some questions from you here um, so the first question is, can you suggest a few tips for vocalist? Now, uh, if I have um, heard you correctly, Dr. Sharoff, uh, you talked about the breathing yes. for the vocalist, but also yes. I think the person is asking for more, perhaps a posture, etc. Yes, actually that's a very good question. I'm glad he asked because I did not get time to focus on the breathing side of things because we are limited with it. But it's, it's a good thing that we can talk about it now. Can we have you back please, Dr. Sakshi? But from a physical therapist point of view, what would I see in a vocalist? As I mentioned earlier, breathing is better. Can we have you turn sideways? Now if we can have you take a deep breath. Okay? You have enough place to expand the chest in all directions. Now let's have you slouch. Now breathe in. Now you're fighting against your own weight. So breathing again can be helped if one, you correct this position. 
So one, posture correction. So getting it aligned better so that you open up the space. If you are only cramping up your rib cage, you are not allowing the lungs to expand. If you are not having air going in, how will you use it to use your vocal cords? So for projection, you need more air. To have more air, one, better position. Two, to help you get here, you will stretch these muscles, you have to strengthen these muscles. So you open it up with the simple exercises we showed, you release the muscles behind. Okay? Three, breathing exercises. Now what are the simple breathing exercises we should do? Okay? Now when we breathe in, what do we do? One is our diaphragm or the breathing muscle goes down and descends. That's when the stomach bulges. Two, there are other muscles that expand our ribs. So we just need to focus on these two simple things. Okay, let's have you lie down over here. Okay. So it would, can be done in standing, sitting, lying down, but this is the most comfortable, relaxed position where you can make a beginning. So in this position, we'll ask you to just keep one hand on the stomach and take a nice deep breath in. And as you breathe in, you should feel the stomach bulging. And when you exhale, if you are controlling your exhalation, it can be made slower. If you are controlling exhalation and keeping air in longer, you have more chance of taking mm. oxygen from it. So we recommend something called pursed lip breathing. Pursed lip is where instead of just letting go air, we slowly blow through our mouth like you are blowing onto you know, hot tea or hot liquid. So can we have you breathe in through the nose and blow out through the mouth. So longer inhalation means a lot of air going in. If possible, a pause to keep it in. And a longer exhalation means that much time for exchange. More oxygen can be absorbed, more carbon dioxide can be released. It makes it more efficient. But it should not be so strenuous that you start tensing your neck muscles. So one, you can tense them and feel a bit uncomfortable. Two, if there is too much pressure building up in the thoracic area, you can get a bit lightheaded. Mm. So we don't want you to go to that extreme. We want you to be comfortable, practice, build it up, it will only get better. So first part is learning to use the diaphragm well. So the expanding the stomach. Breathing. Yes, this is called diaphragmatic. Yes. Then we have the second part called lateral costal, mm. where we can ask you to keep your hands on the side of the ribs. And as you inhale, we want you to feel the expansion happening. Now, a lot of the times, people expand this way. They are working only over here. They forget to work over here. And these are the areas that get tight very easily because of our lack of movement that we've been discussing. So if you can just keep your hands to give you feedback, you can actually feel the chest expanding sideways because the upper expansion is always happening. And then you have to master the skill of using both together. So you have to have a long enough breath that your stomach also bulges out and the ribs also expand to the side. Now believe me, that is supposed to be normal breathing. When you take a breath in, if your chest is expanding in all four ways, your diaphragm breathing muscle goes down, your chest expands from the side, your chest expands from the top and front and back. It's supposed to be like a balloon blowing, you know, in which air is blown in. It has to expand in all four ways. But the way our life has become, our muscles have become tight, we've become stiff, there is minimal expansion happening. So just mastering this normal breathing pattern, which we should actually have, takes a lot of time. So if they could master this, and they will automatically be able to have more air in, mm -hmm. not only they'll have more energy, they'll have better projection as well. Yes. So in general, this breathing <coughs> technique that you're talking about yes. is required for any person to remain healthy. Yes. A musician and perhaps vocalist more yes. because, you know, their whole fuel is the breath. Yes. Because the voice can be produced only at the time of exhalation. Yes, I mean, you try slouching and talking. See how yes. you feel. Yes, I know. Because you'll be struggling, there's not yes. enough air coming there's out. No you won't be able to articulate. Yeah. You won't be able to vocalize. Yes. So you have performers who are performing and singing. Yeah. There's no way they can sit like this. I mean, they'll be able to perform, but they won't be able to so vocalize. there is an ancillary question that I yes. would like to ask. You talked about the breathing in a yes. lot and then you also showed a breathing out with the mouth. Yes. So in t in uh, case of vocalists who are now sitting in a, you know, separ in Indian musician, cross yes. legs position and then, yes. you know, like a yogic position perhaps and they yes. are inhaled. And now they are, uh, you know, uh, intoning, you know, bringing the voice out with yes. the exhaled air. Yes. So they need to also practice the slow exhalation of air to be able to use maximum exactly. to their I mean, advantage, right? Good inhalation will lead to good exhalation. Yes. So yes. if they work on inhalation and holding, yes. they are allowing a lot of oxygen exchange from physiology point of view so that yeah. they become more energy efficient. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, is the amount of air they are able to inhale. Mm -hmm. Let's have you sit up cross-legged. Mm -hmm. So can you face that side? So same same rules apply. So even when she is slouched in cross-legged position, she is automatically... Mm -hmm 
cramping the chest space and she won't be able to inhale better. So as I mentioned earlier, just a little bit of shift in position and everything falls into place. It's just that the legs are crossed. Yes. And yes. the only difference between your cross leg sitting and standing would be, yeah. do you have enough flexibility to sit cross leg comfortably? If that throws your pelvis out of posture, you won't be able to correct by only correcting the upper half. So that's where the value of stretching the leg muscles comes in. Otherwise, a lot of the mechanics are quite similar. So then in a nutshell, I think what we need to <coughs> understand, uh, Dr. Prakash, is that, uh, you know, many vocalists per se, I know that they give a lot of importance and attention towards other than the what to sing, the content. Yes. They give a lot of importance or they work hard on the voice culture, as yes. they say. But yes. the, I think the importance also needs to be to the breathing, yeah. which has to yeah. be a part of because voice culture. Because voice is the vibration of yes. the chords, which is yes. happening with air. Yes. And if you're having more air, you yes. can play around more with it. Yes. So that's a very good uh, um, conclusion on that. Now the next question is how to prevent shoulder pain when working on a seated position for an extended period. Now the shoulder pain more often than not comes because of bad shoulder blade alignment. So let's have you turn around and face that side. Now if she is sitting with either the shoulder dropped or if she is sitting where the shoulder is forward, any kind of lack of alignment from the shoulder blade tends to make your shoulder muscles work differently. Okay? If you have the shoulder blade aligned well, if this base is working well, the shoulder blade is your base on which the arm moves. Base will give stability, arm will move better. Mm. Base is out of position, arm will definitely have to work to compensate this out of position. Mm. Maybe some muscles work harder, some muscles are mm. working in a disadvantaged, shortened position. And of course, there are not many places where you take the arm up because impingement can also happen. Mm. So very rarely any performer has to do that. But yes, this lack of alignment with either being down or either being forward, you can imagine the number of stresses building up. Mm. I spoke mainly of the spine, but of course the shoulder is the next one close to the spine, mm. which will suffer that. And that is the base on which everything is, no? Mm. Ultimately, all movement is happening with the shoulder. So if I'm in this position, I mean, you can try it for yourself. If you slouch forward, you won't have enough range to lift the arms. Mm. The minute you're in a better position, your arm goes up. So you can see how the joint is straight away working differently. So shoulder pain definitely is a repercussion of bad shoulder blade position, which you can say is part of the central system itself or the spine. A good base will make the periphery work better. So we come back to having a good starting position and a good posture. You know, two things uh, really caught my attention when you were speaking. Firstly, you said even with so-called correct posture, yes, it can give you, start giving you pain that yes. is sheer because of the repetitions of the action. Yes. So this is the, I take as a behavior of the normal body. Right? Even Our the body, so yes, has got a lot of joints which move mm. in different directions. Mm. It's meant to do much more. But mm. we are artificially putting it in one position and repeating something over and over and again, mm. which is a requirement either by choice or by yes. profession yes. as a need. So if it is to be done, is your body ready for it? Mm. Which is where the importance of fitness comes in. Demand supply. Is you your body ready fitness. for the load you're putting it through? Mm. So besides posture and stretching, strengthening, conditioning, fitness, everything matters. So you have to go and exercise and be fit. Keep your muscles ready for action, no? That's what athletes do. If they want to perform, yeah. they get ready for performance. They want to perform more, they work harder. Same way, why should any performer in terms of a musician be different? You're going to put in hours doing one activity again and again and again. Is your muscle ready for it? It's not designed for it, but you can make it ready for it. I mean, you have people who are, you know, doing rifle shooting, holding their arm out endlessly. Yeah. But they are trained to do that, no? You are holding your arm out to play endlessly. Just train yourself to do that. It's possible. Okay? So then there is a very naive question. Pardon me for asking, uh, you know, from a layman's perspective. Yes. Do we assume that, you know, in whatever we are doing, until we experience some kind of pain, yes. that we are okay? Yes, I would say that. So I would not want to change anything you if you have no trouble. Okay. Now, you will see there are some people who are lucky enough that even mm. they are slightly out of position, mm. out of posture, mm. they just don't have any problems. Because what we think pain is only from the physical stress. Mm. There are a lot of other factors in our life that can influence mm. our pain. Mm. I mean, you've seen it for yourself. When you're stressed, the pain is more. When you're not stressed, the pain suddenly disappears. When you're going on holiday, you end up walking so much, you come back and few steps and it's hurting. Mm. So there are a lot of other factors that contribute to your pain experience. And once we look at someone and we see something altered, we would love to change it. I would not want to do that. I would want to change something only if you have symptoms. So yes, if something is 
so called out from normal mm. but you are comfortable mm. i will not change anything in you right. but you start saying you know i get tired very easily mm. i get stiff mm. i may not wait for pain mm. to come mm. but it is interfering with performance and mm. you're aware of that yes. then we should start looking at what we can do to make this better Correct. because if you say no matter how much i perform no matter what i do i'm good i'm fine i can do more of it i shouldn't change anything in you okay the next question is uh, a friend is asking uh, how do you control position of the pelvis so position of the pelvis is one through the muscles that we stretch as we mentioned because the tight muscles may be throwing the pelvis out of position two can we have you turn to the side please okay as i mentioned when we are sitting we need to feel the pressure on the seat bones okay now for this we need to discuss what is called the neutral pelvis okay so in this position if i ask her to push forward arch your back this is one extreme position and if i ask her to drop it this is the other extreme position as we okay. in middle so you go to your extreme arching and go to the extreme flattening and come somewhere in the center mm. where you feel your seat bones are putting enough pressure down you've got a neutral pelvis so you can try and achieve this ideal position for pelvis during the sitting posture in performance yes because i need you to find your neutral mm. you may be a person with a slightly arched back i yes. should not change that it should be normal for you mm. so whatever feels efficient mm. less energy consumption easy and whatever feels more normal for you more neutral for you hmm. find your neutral and be in that okay you talked a lot about uh, you know from the physiotherapist point of view uh, corrections you know without any external medication but yes what is the role of the medication and when does it come in as i mentioned in the inflammatory conditions where there is inflammation hmm. now though inflammation is a sign of healing the pain tends to be quite bad and people say you need anti inflammatories but more importantly we need analgesics we okay. want the pain to go down mm. we would let the inflammation be because it's doing the repair work mm. right it's like a construction site it looks ugly but when the building is made it's all neat so body has sent material for repair let it do its job you are bothered by the pain do something about the pain so ice packs you know support balms that you mm. can apply mm. and when it is too bad and you are not comfortable yes medicines have a role mm. so that is where the doctor comes in a gp or any orthopedic should prescribe mm. the medicine and more often than not the medicine is when either we are not able to control the inflammation because naturally as the repair happens it should go down and you should get more better you should get comfortable if that's not happening or if the pain like nerve pain or any muscle pain is so much that you are not comfortable doing your daily activities mm. then it becomes a choice okay to get comfortable i would take medicines or if you are doing therapy and i'm giving you posture correction exercises but the pain is interfering and i feel stuck you know i can't progress why not get you some help to make you comfortable so we can progress further over here okay so that is the stage where medicine yeah. definitely so the, has a role then this medication the role of medication is kept minimal and for which i think we are well i would say it is not ruled out ha huh. for some cases it is definitely there but i wouldn't okay. say no okay yeah so correction etc is by physical means only and see body is going to heal like itself we can yes. do nothing to heal yes. the body yes it's just that the symptoms bother us so we yes. want to do something about yes. them so your choice you are willing to go through the pain and allow the body to take its natural yeah. course or you want to get you know things under control faster mm. and mm. i mean you have performance pressure something yeah. coming up then all the means are available to suppress the symptoms so you at least perform and then take your time to get better later yeah. so it all depends on these other factors as well okay uh, one more question is uh, you talked about something about visualization yes can you please elaborate on that oh, visualization is basically imagining yourself doing something okay in your brain so we underestimate the power of the brain now all the control of the hands legs is from the signal coming from the brain to the hand right now when i am performing there are certain circuits in my brain which are active which are sending signals to these muscles and they are working and how do we have memory we do it again and again and again and we tend to use this word called muscle memory also yes you just go and it happens what that has happened to sheer repetition mm. now if we take a step back and instead of performing i sit quietly close my eyes and see myself performing now in seeing myself performing to see myself in that position using those muscles doing the exact same thing i am recruiting similar pathways no i am not making new pathways for this though i am not using all of them so if my muscle to become active maybe needs 100 pathways to fire for me to visualize 50 pathways are enough Hmm. so in a way i am maintaining my practice maintaining activity in my pathways without actually putting physical effort okay we use this lot of people actually visualize in sporting scenario what they are going to do their good shots their good times and they actually go and it just happens 
because you're actually in a way pre-activated. Your fibers are recruited and then it just happens. So you don't have to execute all you the time. You don't have to execute. But so you have to work your brain there. Yes. About those techniques and then it will happen when yes, you are yes. actually in that scene. As I say, Idle Wonderful. Mind is a devil's workshop. I would mm. say there is visible labor and invisible labor. You can actually mm. work while you're visualizing it. Mm. You said visual labor and? Invisible labor. Okay. I mean, what is happening in your mind, no one can see. Mm. You want to see, experience the power of visualization? Yes. Okay. You want to come? I'll show you a small demo. Okay. Come. You feel for yourself because, okay, let's have you face forward. Okay. Can you move your aside and come step forward? Okay. Now I need you to take your hand forward like this. Okay. And now without moving your feet, turn around. Okay. And so I need you to turn around like this and observe everything that will come in front of you as you turn. Keep turning. So shall I actually turn? Yes, turn. Keep turning your body also, but not your feet. See how far you can go. And see what all you are is coming in your view. Mm -hmm. So you finished where you could almost see Dr. Sakshi. Yes. Okay. You recorded more of the things, the background, the room and everything. You, you know what the room looks like. Now I need you to close your eyes. You will not move, okay? And I need you to visualize that you've got your hand forward, like you did earlier, mm. right? You're pointing forward. Mm. And you saw the cameraman standing there. Mm. Now you are actually turning mm. in your brain. Yes. You saw the cameraman on the right. Yes. Did you see the podium you were standing? Yes, and the Then standees the, the standees. Yes. Did you reach Dr. Sakshi? Yes. Now can you, in your mind, keep turning? Don't stop, mm. okay? You can see my podium. You can see me standing on your side yes. and you're back to the front cameraman. Yes. Right? You all twisted 360 like plastic woman. Yes. Okay? Now let's see if you unwind. Mm -hmm. Come back. Go left. You'll see me. Mm -hmm. Go left, my podium. Mm -hmm. Go left, the standee. Mm -hmm. Then Sakshi. Yes. Then the other podium. Yes. The other cameraman. Yes. Back to the center. Yeah. Open your eyes. So okay? Yes. This was visualization. Okay. Now see the effect of this on your body. Get your hand forward and turn like you did earlier. Okay, don't move your feet. Keep going. Is there a difference? Yes. What is the difference? There is a certain amount of ease and... Uh, and you know. didn't take your finger towards Sakshi last time. Yes. Now you went further? Yes. So what I did? I just exercised your brain. We used the circuits that you would use to actually execute this and I made you go a bit further and you see how that visualization actually helped improve performance? But then to, for this visualization to happen, yes. first you have to actually... Yes, that is why you need to, yeah, you need to know, you've, that's why I said no, you have to see your recording, see yourself performing and then visualize. Yes. And you see, just by making you visualize, I made, I improved your performance. So what I want to say here is if your part is hurting and you're not using it, use visualization, something is still happening. It's really brilliant. And I think uh, we need to... Uh, sure. We need to, as human beings, really realize the power of our brains and the sensory organs that are at our disposal, you know, the eye and the ear and, you know, for musician, ear is also very important and, yes. you know, this is really brilliant. So, uh, there are some further questions, but I think we should stop at this. But, uh, Dr. Sharoff, uh, before we end this, is there something that you would like to say as a concluding statement? Just a Well, I think I have said a lot seconds. for a long time. But as I said, well begun is half done. So good posture, good alignment is well begun and half done. And things will only fall into place from there. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Sharaf. We can't thank you enough, in fact, for opening us and our audiences to a very new area. And uh, I hope that all the musicians, friends out there take serious note of this and uh, perhaps ask uh, very pertinent and uh, we will share his email ID also so that you can get in touch with him directly about your personal questions. And uh, also Dr. Sakshi, thank you so much. Your body is so ready and uh, I mean wonderful uh, demonstrations. And I take this uh, opportunity to thank all our NCPA um, staff and also our partners, thinkers for brilliant video and uh, production. Uh, thank you all.